Which is why in the course of the game, when you... Mm, 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 it's fine. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'll, uh, I'll do it again. Bloodborne is the fourth in the long-running and incredibly successful... Hang on. No. No, this isn't going to work. Because later on in the script, I say that I haven't played any of the other Soulsborne games. So, you know, why would I... Why would I contextualize things like that? You know, it doesn't make any... It doesn't make any sense. No... It's fine. Look, I'll I'll try something else. Like th this isn't gonna work. It's fine. It's fine. <sighs> it's fine. Let's start at the very beginning. How did I come to play Bloodborne for the very first time? So, late last year, someone who I love very much told me that they thought I needed a hobby. And what they meant by that was something that was just for me, something that wasn't turned into a part of my job as an academic. And for me, at least, this was harder than it sounds because I was working from home, I was staying in the same room for about 18 hours a day, and there really wasn't that much of a separation between my home life and the things that I had to do for work. I think this is a problem that a lot of people take upon themselves. Uh, okay, so when I was a PhD student and then later an adjunct lecturer, um, every year a senior member of management would come in and give a talk, and the title was always the same. The title was The Omnitasking Academic. <laughs> Is it, isn't that just the worst thing you've ever heard in your entire life? <laughs> so the logic was that we shouldn't multitask, we should omnitask. Everything that we do should be aiming towards the same goal. And the goal was, of course, to be the best, most productive, most compliant subject. The best employee. So there I was at home, omnitasking away. And I guess I wasn't happy. I mean, I, it, I was fine. It, it was, it was fine. It was, it was fine. To prepare for doing this, I watched a lot of other videos about Bloodborne and quite a lot of them talk about Bloodborne either mechanically or stylistically, or how Bloodborne fits in with the other From Software games in terms of its look and gameplay. Obviously, all of that is great, but I've never played any of the other Souls games, so if I'm gonna talk about this game, I can't talk about it like that. But I am gonna try. I am gonna try and talk about Bloodborne without turning it into another academic piece of work. Welcome everyone, it's fantastic to have such a turnout and as always can I ask that we hold all questions until we get to the Q&A section of the day. Uh, this is the final day of this year's conference and on behalf of the non-Euclidean media research group I wanted to thank you, uh, say thank you to all of our presenters and participants, uh, of course to our friends at Miskatonic and to the Jervis Dudley Center for Research in Xenophilology for their very generous donation. And now before the close of the day, it's time for the final session. The title, Understanding the Yarnum Lovecraft Connection. One of the very first elements of 
uh, information that the good hunter finds in Yarnum is the injunction to seek pale blood, to transcend the hunt. It would seem almost axiomatic to link Yarnum and Lovecraft's work, but the indicative word of transcendence is an important indicator that we are in Lovecraftian territory. The enemies uh, that you encounter throughout Yarnum have clearly been designed with some idea of Lovecraft's ideas of non-Euclidean horror. Lovecraft's famous saying that the uh, strongest and oldest emotion of mankind is fear, and the fear of the unknown chimes incredibly well with Master Willem's injunction to the fellow students and researchers of Bergenworth to fear the old blood. Of course, as with Lovecraft's, playing the game for the first time was a strange experience. I'd played a few things before that, games which specialised in explaining their systems and mechanics clearly and easily to the player, making the player, me, feel powerful, feel good. Bloodborne doesn't do any of that. It felt hard. It felt unfair. The Yanamites who are just on the cusp of their monstrous becoming march through the streets which are awash with blood and full of pyres of burning corpses. When they spot you, they flail at you with their swords and pitchforks, screaming at you to get back, that you're a monster, that you're a beast. Phenomenologically, it didn't feel like anything else I had played. Uh, obviously, if you play something like The Witcher 3 or whatever theme park the latest Assassin's Creed game is set in, then that is a world that's there for you as a player. Yarnum never felt like that. It took me so long to negotiate the opening areas, mostly because of the open-ended design, the multiple routes that you can take through each area, and some absolutely perfect enemy placements. The environment is not there for you. The streets of Yarnum belong to those who are coming for you. In a way, a lot of criticism or discourse about this game tends to collapse it back into the taxonomies of games which make you feel like this. You know, Souls games. But I've never played any of the Souls games. So there's this um, French writer, Gaston Bachelard. He was a philosopher of science, but he tends not to be the kind of thing that people expect when they think about philosophy of science. Uh, one of his first books was called The Psychoanalysis of Fire. Um, and Bachelard wrote maybe one of the classic books on the feelings that place can give us. Whenever the human being has found the slightest shelter, we shall see the imagination build walls of impalpable shadows, comfort itself with the illusion of protection, or, just the contrary, tremble behind thick walls, mistrust the staunchest ramparts. In short, in the most interminable of dialectics, the sheltered being gives perceptible limits to his shelter. He experiences the house in its reality and in its virtuality by means of thought and dreams. It is no longer in its positive aspects that the house is really lived, nor is it only in the passing hour that we recognize its benefits. An entire past comes to dwell in a new house. You see, space is not neutral or just a given. We bring ourselves into any space that we enter. Our hopes, dreams, memories, our fears. Of course, in video games, this is just environmental design, but there was something in the relationship between the world of Yarnum and the world that I existed in when playing it for the first time. I guess something about a, a game where you explore a deserted city full of people locked in their homes because of a dangerous and infectious disease really resonated last year for some reason. I don't talk about this very much, but I also live with a chronic health condition. It's a uh, vascular disease that needs surgical correction um, and can often make very painful changes to my body. There is something in my blood, in a manner of speaking. So playing it through for the very first time was 
strange. When you encounter the lamps lighting the doorways of the homes of the few people who are left and you talk to them as their minds fracture or their bodies turn against them, changing them into something else. There's this moment of phenomenological confrontation which I didn't want to think about because even in some small way it felt just a bit too close. I don't know if I'll keep this. I don't know if this is worth keeping. I might cut this. It's enormously tempting to consider Bloodborne a Lovecraftian text, but maybe it's more accurate to think of it as a Lovecraft-inspired text. There are key distinctions here, and we should avoid the temptation of collapsing Bloodborne and the ways in which it tries to create a horror that is unique into a pre-existing tradition. Firstly, and perhaps most importantly, is the idea of hit points. You can encounter great unknowable others, and kill them. This is antithetical to the spirit of Lovecraftian horror. A much more compelling uh, modern example of Lovecraftian horror, we should turn to Caitlin R. Kiernan's excellent short story Tidal Forces, which shows in excruciating detail that the Lovecraftian gods of the Cthulhu mythos are fundamentally disinterested in human subjectivity. As we find out through the course of the game, this is not the case with Bloodborne. Abandoned Britus in the care of the choir shows that the Great Ones seem to be interested and drawn to human consciousness. The multiple endings also challenge the notion that this is a Lovecraftian text. The secret third ending, where one ascends to becoming an infant Great One, runs completely against much of what we know about Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, where characters are either driven to sheer insanity or lapse into somatic collapse as language. It's, I guess, ultimately, I don't think the distinction is all that important. And really what I want to try and do is find a way of thinking about Bloodborne as an experience that doesn't collapse it back down into a fairly narrow genealogy of tentacles, ergo Cthulhu, ergo Lovecraft. And I don't think any of that is wrong, but I wonder if we can think about this game in a way that makes it something other than just the latest iteration of its influences. And really, for me, the experience of playing through Bloodborne for the first time was not one of Lovecraftian horror, but one of reckoning and dealing with failure. This functions mechanically. I died a lot. And yes, this is because I wasn't very good at the game in the beginning, or at all. And incidentally, this is probably why so many people love watching Bloodborne speedruns, because there's something hugely cathartic about watching somebody beat in an hour or less what it took you 20 or 30 times that to get close to finishing. But often I died because of a mistake, or because I didn't understand the mechanics, or because of that one hit kill attack that the Bloodstarved Beast can do when the rapid poison builds up so quickly that there's no way- The game functions like that in terms of its narrative as well. So uh, midway through the first area you'll find uh, a small door to a house with a lamp outside. And inside there's a girl's voice who asks you to go and find her mother. Uh, the mother has gone out to look for the father, and the father is a hunter, just like you. And the first time I played this section, I thought to myself, oh, I get this. This is, it's a, it's a fetch quest. It's, it's a recognizable video game moment. So you tell the girl that you will help and you go on your way to look for the mother. The mother, you're told, can be recognized by the very beautiful red jeweled brooch that she wears. You don't find the mother before you find the father, Father Gascoigne. He's gone mad 
there's something in the blood that calls out an irresistible violence. And he functions as the first non-negotiable boss in the entire game. You have to you have to deal with him. Kill. Kill. You have to you have to kill him. Slaughter, as the game puts it. The father can't be saved. And after you've done that, on a body nearby, you find a red jeweled brooch uh, engraved with the name Viola. You thought you were trying to do a good thing. You failed. But you have a choice, right? You can keep the brooch. It's loot after all. Or you could take it back. And there might well be a bigger reward in the long run. So after finding a spot of safety at Erden Chapel, you can go back to the lamp at the door and tell that small scared child about the safety that you found. So to get there, you had to go through the sewers, which was full of mouldering corpses, giant crows, and an enormous ravenous pig. And you think to yourself, there's no way this child will make it. So if you kill the pig, you find in its remains an item that the small messengers who populate most of the game seem very drawn to. A red messenger ribbon. Red ribbon that messengers are oddly fond of. The thick, pungent red was drawn from the organs of some unfortunate victim. A strange choice indeed, but perhaps for the messengers, wearing this accessory constitutes a form of mourning. You can, later in the game, take that item back to the same door, and you'll hear another childlike voice telling you about their younger sister, who left the house on tonight of all nights, and you'll recoil as the voice changes from weeping to a crazed giggle as you hand over the ribbon. Uh, not far from the door, there's uh, a ladder, and at the bottom of the ladder, you'll find another item. This time, it's a white ribbon. White ribbon that messengers are oddly fond of. A ribbon made of fine lace that shines remarkably, more suited to pretty young girls than silly old messengers. An entire family gets wiped out precisely because you thought you'd get to do the right thing. But instead, this first section of the game teaches you incredibly brutally that you're going to fail and you're going to have to carry on despite that. Maybe my favourite moment in the entire game is just after the death of Rom the Vacuous Spider, where you arrive in Yahagul and you're forced to confront with sober senses the world as it truly is. Every comforting illusion gets stripped away. The sky is this murky red haze. You see the amygdalas clinging to every wall. In the sewers beneath the chapel, something monstrous is born. It's the moment that you realise that things are not just bad, they're so much worse. And you have to carry on. And the way that you carry on, at least for me, was not through success, or at least not success directly. The way that you carry on, the way that you complete the game, is by learning to fail better. There's something fascinating about the idea of failure. Um, we don't like to talk about it. Um, to fail is seen as something catastrophic, a mistake that has to be rectified. So there's something kind of impressive about FromSoft's willingness to make failure such an integral part of the game experience. Even at the very conclusion of the game, with its three possible endings, you're forced to reckon with your own inability to accomplish the things that you'd set out to do. Let me explain. One of the earliest bits of the relatively rare kind of plot text that you'll uh, find in the course of the game to escape this dreadful hunter's dream, halt the source of the spreading scourge of beasts, lest the night carry on forever. Incidentally, this is one of the very best things about the game, and I'm assuming the other FromSoft games 
Um, there's a huge amount of plot, but it's all de delivered indirectly. Nobody ever exposits to you about precisely what's happening. You're left to work it out for yourself. Um, and this manages to do two things. It increases player involvement because you feel like you're an active participant trying to solve the mystery around you. And secondly, it means that this is a really fun game to speculate about as the still thriving ecosystem of Bloodborne lore videos goes some way to proving. Around the same time uh, as you find this text, you will encounter a character called German who tells you that they are a friend to hunters, to people like you. German says to not worry, to not think too much about what's going on, but just go out and kill a few beasts. After all, that's what hunters do. So for people who haven't played the game, you might be wondering, do you get to leave the hunter's dream? Do you end the spreading scourge of beasts? Well, no. There are three possible endings that you can get in the game. Uh, in the first, German asks you to submit your life. You're decapitated, you awake under a sunrise. The dream is over, but only for you. In the second, you refuse the injunction to submit your life. You're thrown into a fight with German, and you have to win, and you cannot change your mind. Kill German! And he whispers that the night and the dream were long, and you see an ominous shape approach. There's a cutscene, and then, like German before you, you are in a wheelchair. You are the new host of the dream, and soon new hunters will be arriving. The third ending depends upon finding three out of four particular items that are hidden throughout the course of the game. If you find them and you use them before the final fight with German, you... Again, have to deal with your old friend, you have to kill him. If you do this, after your fight with German, you're dropped into another confrontation, this time with a creature known as the Moon Presence. If you beat the Moon Presence, you don't get the normal Prey Slaughtered screen that flashes up, but rather uh, the screen displays Nightmare Slain. There's a cutscene where you see the character of the doll, who has been a constant presence in the dream, holding what looks like a large slug. It's you. You've become something else. You see, the thing is, the endings don't resolve neatly. A lot of the discussion online about the endings tends to try and taxonomize them. You know, which one is the good one, which one's the bad one, that kind of thing. And I understand the impulse, but to me, Something about it is missing the point, because whichever ending you get, or whichever ending you think is the good one, reveals more about your own interpretive framework and your own experiences with the game than anything intrinsic to the game itself. You see, even at the end of the game, you're faced, no matter which ending you get, with a kind of beginning again. You will wake up from the dream and have to go on. The hunt resumes with you as the host of the dream. You have become a new kind of subject. Even at the very end of things, you haven't really done what you set out to do. All you've managed to do is learn how to fail better. This raises an interesting question though. Who is it that fails? Well, it's the character, right? See, as I've thought about making this video, I've been struck by something in how this game is talked about online. Bloodborne is a really fun game to speculate about, to write about, to have theories about. But in the midst of all that theorizing, in the midst of all that speculation, there's often an element which is absent. The hunter themselves, an absent center in a nexus of discourse. So who is it that fails? When you draw up your contract at the very beginning of the game, you can um, choose your character's skills and, and background, but as the game continues, you can modify your character's skills to best suit your playstyle. In that last sentence, you can already hear a sort of semantic slippage. It's the character that moves through the world, but it's the player 
that fails. The Good Hunter has a weak ontology, a kind of transparency that means no matter what background you pick for them or what weapon you give them, Threaded Cane, still my favourite, it's ultimately you that has to reckon and deal with failing at points where the game gets tough and your mileage may vary, but for me that was the Living Failures fight and the Blood Starved Beast. The Good Hunter gets trapped in a cycle of endless recurrence, living and dying the same moments over and over again. You can become the monster of legend as you send them back to low level areas so you can farm blood vials and items. Oh god, it's all your fault, the people of Yarnum shout. Who are they talking to? The hunter? Or someone else? The great theorist of failure is Samuel Beckett, the Irish writer, playwright, critic, director, and translator. A lot of Beckett's work is very minimalist. Uh, setting, characters, plot, everything gets stripped back to the very barest of bones. And of course, this is in complete contrast to the decaying, lush, gothic excess of Yarnum. In Beckett, language at times seems to break down into nothing more than rhythm and sound. His most famous play, Waiting for Godot, is a play in which nothing happens, and the second act is essentially a repetition of the first, so it's a play in which nothing happens twice. Some of his writing even doesn't have characters, maybe just a mouth in shadow, or funerary urns, out of which you hear voices. Discussing his writing in the early 60s, Beckett described a process of getting down below the surface towards the authentic weakness of being. Failure remained unavoidable because whatever is said is so far from the experience that if you really get down to the disaster, the slightest eloquence becomes unbearable. There's a famous quote from Beckett's work that gets called on quite a lot. It's a short fragment from a, um, a prose piece called Worstwood Ho. Ever tried? Ever failed? No matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. You've almost certainly seen that or read that on a thousand, thousand blogs, websites, and Twitter feeds. It's a quote beloved by very online internet entrepreneurs or executives who see it as a clarion call, a rallying cry to just try harder. There's a great piece in The New Republic where the author talks about this phenomenon. Watching a liturgy from such a gloomy and merciless author getting repurposed to cheer up mid-level executives is like watching a neighbour clear out their gutters with a stick they found in the garden not realising the stick is in fact a human shin bone. How do we go on is really the question that so much of Beckett's work revolves around. The impossibility of making meaning the existential bleakness of the human condition, our own physical contingency as our bodies get old or sick. Sometimes we might not even be allowed to go outside, to hold hands or to hug those that we love. Sometimes you might find yourself living through what seems to be the same long night, stuck in the same place, fighting the same nightmares over and over again. I finished the game. I got an ending. A good ending. Maybe the good ending, depending on your point of view. And the thing is, no matter how much the game forces you to reckon with failure, to fail again and again until you get to the end, all of those endings contain within them the possibility of new beginnings. You can start New Game Plus if you want to. You can do it all. Play through the game all over again. Getting it better. Getting it right this time. Every beginning is, no matter how bleak the circumstances, also the condition of possibility for something new. Maybe something better, even if we can't imagine what that might look like. A few lines further on in that piece that the fail better quote comes from, 
there's something else. There is maybe the possibility of hope. No choice but stand. Somehow, up and stand. Somehow stand. Or, as a single line of dialogue from Bloodborne can remind us, endings and beginnings, the familiar and the new, are all intimately bound up with one another. Ah, sweet child of Kos, returned to the ocean, a bottomless curse, a bottomless sea, accepting of all that there is and can be. Okay, that's it. I don't know, I might, I might try this again, but um, I think that's it. Yeah, it's fine.